Hi, you guys. Welcome to Audrey's Reading Area. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, today's Wednesday, and you know we do different culture books on Wednesdays, and I got a very special one that I'll be reading to you. But first, I got to shout out my four grandbabies. Four. Four. Korea, Sanaa, David the Third, and Kaden. I love and miss you all so much. Alexa, what time is Audrey's Reading Area? Audrey reads in her area live at five, and please subscribe. That's L-I-V-E, live at five. And won't you subscribe to Audrey's Reading Area? Subscribe. Hit that subscribe button. Show support. <clears throat> all right, all right, all right. On this Multicultural Wednesday, I found this interesting book, Re Re Rebel Voices, Rebel Voices, the global fight for women's equality and the right to vote. So uh, when you, you, you may think it's like an educational book, which is also educational. And I didn't read it on a Tuesday because it is Wednesday. They have voices from different countries. And if that's not multicultural, I don't know what is. So Rebel Voices, the global fight for women's equality and the right to vote. It's written by Eve Lloyd Knight and the uh, illustrations are by Louise K. Stewart. Mm-hmm. I'll just jump right in and read this to you. Yes. On the back, it says, rule breakers, ring takers. I might be pronouncing it wrong or reading it wrong. Rebel women lawmakers. So in 1893, New Zealand gave women the vote and changed the course of history. Like a tsunami, the women's suffrage movement roared around the globe and waves of change lapped at the shores of every country in the world. Discover the inspiring stories of the incredible women who gave their all and in some cases their lives to gain the vote. Mm-hmm. And it is a scholastic book. Let's jump right in and let me show you the timeline that they have here. This is the timeline. Okay. From wet rebel women to global suffrage. We're not daughters, not wives. We're humans with lives. So, I'm going to show you this page. You can pause and read and pause and read. Yes. Rebel women. So, 1893 to 1915, the trailblazers. Women around the world had been fighting for a voice and a vote for many years, but it was the expectation defying frontier women who worked the wild, rugged land as hard as men or fought alongside them to free their country from foreign rule, who kicked start, kick started everything. And we're reading about New Zealand, the person in New Zealand, heads turned as Kate Shepherd sped through the streets of uh, Christchurch, New Zealand on a bike in 1892. People thought that exercise like this could damage fragile women. So they discouraged the unladylike behavior. But cycling gave Kate and her friends independence when most women weren't allowed to own property or have an education or a career. Mm. Kate's family had traveled to New Zealand from Britain along with thousands of other settlers during the 1850s. Life was hard in this tough new land and women worked alongside men building homes and tending farms because they were working as equals. Women wanted to be treated as equals, and this including, included being allowed to vote. To raise support for their cause, women published pamphlets, collected petitions, and lobbied politicians. Kate traveled the country giving empowering speeches that drowned out any opposition. In 1893, history was made when both indigenous um, Maori women and female European settlers 
became the first women in the world to win the right to vote mm, in a national election. Their success started a ripple that turned into a wave that began to spread around the world. Mm-hmm. Australia, the waves, and this is in 1902, the waves of change from New Zealand soon lapped at the shores of nearby Australia, another country full of adventurous European settlers who had braved long voyages to start new lives on the other side of the world. One rebellious woman fighting for change was Vita Goldstein, Vita Goldstein. In 1891, she and her followers marched from door to door for six months, collecting a whopping 33,000 signatures demanding women's equality. They glued the petitions to a long roll of cotton and dragged it to parliament. Male politicians gasped in surprise as a 260 meter long petition was petition the largest Australia had ever seen was ceremoniously unrolled. In spite of this triumph, it took 10 more years of political wrangling before Vita and the women of Australia celebrated winning both the vote and the right to run for parliament. Their victory in Australia inspired Vita and other suffragists to travel to the UK and the United States of America to campaign with their suffrage sisters for the vote. Voting rights were only skin deep though. Unlike in New Zealand, Australia, um, Australian Aboriginal women and men didn't get the vote until 1962, 60 years later. Sadly, Australia wasn't the only place in the world to grant women the right to vote, but deny it to minorities. Mm. Nordic countries, 1913 to 1915. As congratulations poured into New Zealand and Australia, rebel voices in another corner of the globe were determined to be heard. They were determined to be heard. As each Nordic country broke free from the grip of foreign rule, women seized their chance. Even the cold wind couldn't wipe the smile of satisfactions from Norwegian Gina Krog's face. She was one of the, four, the first women in the world to submit a mountain, to summit a mountain, at a time when ladies weren't even encouraged to set foot in a restaurant alone. Fired up by the British suffragists she had seen while studying in the UK, Gina set her sights on securing Norwegian women the vote. After years of writing articles, organizing protest groups, and struggling to be heard, on June 11, 1913, she conquered this obstacle as well. So you can pause and read the rest. Yes. Women at War, this is Russia, 1917 to 1945. Over the next 30 years, the world and women went to war. Mm. Uh, firebrand feminists toiled and fought for their countries in revolutions and world conflicts, facing hardships and horror as bravely as any man. They also engaged in battles on the home front, marching, protesting, and using any means in their power to combat inequality and win the right to vote. Mm. So gray foreboding skies didn't deter the peasant women jostling eagerly through the crowds to join the uh, procession marching down St. Petersburg streets on March 19, 1917. Heads wrapped tightly in plain headscarves, they mingled freely with wealthy sister protesters in extravagant fur and feather hats. Soon there was an army of 40,000 determined women advancing towards the Russian parliament. So I want you to read the rest on your own due to lack of time, only due to lack of time. But I will mention specters cheered as rebel leader Vera Figner waved from an open 
top car. And two orchestras gave the procession a carnival atmosphere. Vera Figner. So, yes. Have to mention their names. United Kingdom, the UK. 1918. Throughout the 19th century, century suffragists in the UK protested peacefully, inspiring women worldwide. But by the early 1900s, they still had not won the vote. Enraged by the lack of progress, some rebel women decided that extreme action was the only way to make their voices heard. Emmeline Pankhurst, Emmeline Pankhurst and her followers were the vanguard of a new kind of British army. They wore votes for women sashes like battle dress and marched to huge noisy rallies. They attempted to invade parliament and to force their way into Buckingham Palace to appeal directly to the king. They also took guerrilla action to grab attention for their cause, pulling hidden hammers from their flowing skirts. They smashed hundreds of windows, set mailboxes ablaze, and started riots. Reporting on their hell-raising acts of disruption, one newspaper sneeringly dubbed them suffragettes. Suffragettes. The rebels embraced this new name, ensuring the attempt to denigrate them as second-class suffragists failed. You can go ahead and read this paragraph. Pause and read. I probably should read this. It sounds important. Let me read this. The suffragettes suffered for their actions, beaten in violent clashes with police. Many bruised and bloodied protesters were strong-armed into vans and dumped in prisons, jailed suffrages, protested by refusing to eat, but were brutally and repeatedly force-fed by guards that, by guards through long plastic tubes. Wow. Some never recovered from their ordeal. In the end though, the ill treated back, the ill treatment backfired and won the suffering suffragettes welcome, publicity and sympathy. When the first world war broke out in 1914, the suffragettes put their protests on hold. Women set aside their sashes to drive trolley cars, build weapons, dig in coal mines and take over many other jobs left vacant by men who enlisted. Their stout hearted efforts torpedoed any claims they weren't e that they weren't equal to men. When the war, the war ended in 1918, women were granted the vote at last. They had to physically stand up and show that they are equal. Canada, Canada. 1918, the long lavish curtains parted to reveal a noisy mock parliament on the theater stage in Winnipeg, Canada. In a cheeky role reversal, the parliament was made up of women with high profile suffragists acting as ministers. Hmm. A group of men with a wheelbarrow full of petitions arrived on stage pleading for their right to vote. Hmm. Nellie McClung rose to answer them. Nellie McClung. Nellie was in character as the Canadian premier and set about mocking and mimicking one of his real speeches. To cheers of delight from the audience, Nellie scoffed that men would waste the votes, that their place was on the farm, and that giving them the vote would unsettle the family in the home. She even jokingly complimented them on their looks. The theater rocked with laughter. The show was a sensation. It was 1914 in Canada, like Britain was at war. Go ahead and read, read, read. Pause and read that part. I apologize for the lack of time. Ooh, what a pretty picture, huh? What's a pretty picture? USA, 1920 through 1965. At six feet tall, Sojourner Truth 
Sojourner Truth. Sojourner Truth. I didn't know she was six feet tall. She towered above her audience. Speaking in Ohio in 1851, her powerful voice held listeners like a magnet as she half spoke, half sang a sermon supporting women's suffrage and denouncing slavery. Sojourner Truth was a name she chosen herself after becoming free. It steeled her on her long journeys across America to spread her message to hundreds of listeners. Stirring speeches from charismatic feminists like Sojourner persuaded others to enlist in the suffragist struggle. There was a huge struggle for women. Still struggling too. We are. In 1866, angry women filled New York's harborside in protest with the stat when the Statue of Liberty was unveiled. They were furious that a female statue was to be an icon of freedom when they had no freedom to vote. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. They were mad that the Statue of Liberty was female because women didn't have a right to vote anyway. So why should they represent freedom with a woman, with a woman, a female statue? That's crazy. I didn't know that. In 1872, that was 1866, by the way. In 1872, U.S. feminist Susan Anthony, is that Susan B. Anthony? Susan Anthony argued officials into letting her vote in a presidential election. Susan was arrested and failed to persuade the jury that women had a right to vote. Yet her trial made front page news. Women hadn't won the war, but they'd publicized their cause. Mm. In, a, in 1917, Alice Paul, later to become the leader of the National Women's Party, led a team of banner-waving suffragists in a silent vigil outside the White House. This quiet rebellion lasted more than two years. Two years. The authorities tried to stop these very public demonstrations from dominating the news by throwing the suffragists in jail. When the violently beaten, force-fed, and brutalized suffragists were released, many were too weak to walk on their own. Yet they donned prison uniforms and traveled the U.S., giving rouse, uh, rousing speeches about their injustices to increasingly large crowds. Hmm. The tide of public opinion turned in the suffragists' favor and in 1920, 8 million white American women voted in a presidential election for the first time in their lives. Now, you heard they said 8 million white. That's W-H-I-T-E. 8 million white American women voted in that presidential election for the very first time in their lives. Sadly, though, their African-American sisters faced a further battle as discriminate, discriminatory practices in many states prevented them from vote, voting. They had to wait until 1965 when pressure from the civil rights movement led President Johnson to make reforms before they could freely exercise their right to vote. Wow. Just wow. And this is Sojourner Truth. Just wow. Ecuador, 1929. Whilst many women battled for years to alter outdated voting laws in America, it was the fearless actions of a single courageous challenger that provoked change in Ecuador. Matilde Hildago de Procel was a small girl with big ambitions, big ambitions. Matilde Hidalgo de Procel was a small girl with big ambitions. Branded a troublemaker from a young age, Matilde sparked her first scandal when she persuaded the director of her local high school to offer her a place, a privilege until then enjoyed only by the boys. Horrified mothers banned their daughters from befriending her and Matilde braved a daily gauntlet of insults on her way to school. Even her local priest 
tried to humiliate her. That's not nice. Tried to humiliate her into submission by making her listen to services two paces outside the church door. She had to stand outside the church door while listening to the sermon. These cruel attacks wounded Matilde, but also drove her on. She became the first female doctor in Ecuador and aspired to open doors for other women too. Her chance came when she discovered that although no women had ever voted in Ecuador, it was not actually illegal for them to do so. She discovered there was no law against the women voting. Wow. Walking tall, she entered a polling station in 1924, sweeping past outraged officials who could do nothing to stop her. As she made her mark, Matilde gained another first. She was the first woman to vote in a general election in the whole of South America. She had broken down the barrier, keeping politics and women apart. By 1929, all Ecuadorian women could follow the intrepid Matilde into the polling station. Mm -mm. That's right. South Africa. South Africa. In Ecuador, it was hard enough for women to win equality. But in South Africa's two-tiered society, where white European settlers ruled a black majority, the struggle to secure the vote was all for all was even more difficult. When white, white South African women were granted the vote by an all white, all male government in 1930, many of them celebrated this long awaited victory. Certain of their, certain of their superiority, they even supported fresh laws to suppress the black men and women who worked in their homes and fields. But other white women were ashamed of the result and marched and demonstrated in support of their black sisters and brothers. That's what I'm talking about. One group of white rebel women known as the Black Sash stood in powerful, silent protest in prominent places. They wore wide black sashes mourning the death of equal rights. On August 9, 1956, Members of the Black Sash joined a historic march against the unfair laws that divided South African society. Wow, 20,000 angry women came from afar and wide to raise their arms. And voices in protest against the political change that bound them. After handing the government hefty petitions containing 100,000 signatures, this vast community of women stood in a compelling, absolute silence for half an hour before breaking into a thundering song of defiance. Now you have touched the women, you have struck a rock. Now you have touched the women, you have struck a rock, you have dislodged a boulder, you will be crushed. The Women's March was a spectacular success but protesters needed the strength of a rock or boulder to endure the tough years of riots, violence, arrests, and beatings that lay ahead of them. At last in 1994, black men and women were granted the right to vote. Today, August 9 is a national, national holiday in South Africa to remember and honor women's valiant efforts to create a fairer society. Valiant. Mm. France, 1944, France. Cameras began clicking the moment Marguerite Durand left her Parisian house with a majestic lioness in tow. It was 1910. Rest in peace, mother. My grandmother was born in 1910, June 25th to be exact. It was 1910 and pedestrians gazed in open mouthed astonishment as she par paraded her unusual pet through the bustling streets, dressed in the latest eye-catching fashions. Duran's stunt made front page news and gave her the chance to promote women's suffrage and spread the word about injustice. 
French suffragists knew that getting into the news could win them attention and support. Mm -mm. In spite of the suffragists' best efforts, many French traditionalists still held on to the idea promoted by one government's advisors that women's hands were not for holding ballot boxes, but for kisses. Come on. In the end, it was women's lion-hearted efforts in the French resistance during the Second World War, fighting bravely against the Nazi German occupation of their country, which finally made the difference. At last, in 1944, 4-4, the real lionesses of France won their right to vote. Shout out to my mom, born in 1944. Isn't that crazy that you mentioned 2010? Hmm? I'm sorry, they mentioned 1910. My grandmother's birthday in 1944. Her daughter, my mom's birthday, 1944. Cool. Italy. Italy. A noise disturbed Ada Gobetti, and she cautiously put down her pen to listen. Silence once more. Reassured. Ada returned to the notebook she used to record her daring activities as part of the Italian Renaissance to the Nazi occupation during the Second World War. Ada and her comrades smuggled weapons and explosives through dense mountain forests and carried messages across enemy lines under the watchful eyes of armed guards. Wow. But tonight, wielding a machine gun under a sky full of stars, Ada and her team had derailed an enemy trail. Keep reading it, y'all. An enemy train. By preventing the Nazis carrying equipment across France, she helped to stop them extending their power. Ada frowned slightly as she carefully translated her latest escape into the secret code she always used. She knew that if her notebook was ever found, and the code deciphered, or deciphered, she would be executed immediately. Read on, you guys. Pause and read. When they go on to say to talk about how Ada was one of the many heroines who risked their lives for their cause during the Second World War. Read on. Wow, it's a powerful book here. Powerful. I might read this again during Women's Month. National Women's Month. Before 1945, we're talking about Japan here in 1945. Japan, isn't this beautiful? Japan. Japanese women had even fewer rights than women in France and Italy. They were expected to keep to the home and to walk three paces behind their husbands when they ventured outside. Women like actress and activist Kimura Kamako, Komako, ignored such such restrictions. In 1917, she dressed in her finest kimono and marched proudly alongside 20,000 people in New York, USA, to demand that women everywhere get the vote. Her presence at the march caused a sensation in Japan. After sharing ideas with enthusiastics, American suffragist Kimuro Komako returned home. In Japan, her fame and inspiring feminist magazine named Shin Shin Fujin, New Real Woman, brought publicity to the cause and inspired other women to join the Japanese suffrage, suffrage movement. When Kimura made headlines, famous feminist Fushé Okay, forgive me if I pronounce these words incorrectly. Please forgive me in advance. Fushé Ichikawa, Ichikawa made other breakthroughs, giving rebellious talks that spread the messages of equality from village to village like wildflower. She never gave up. Even when an angry man tried to drag her from a stage in 1931 in an ugly attempt to silence her, Even during the Second World War, when the government insisted women's place was in the home whilst encouraging them to work in factories. 
and suffrages, suffrage groups were largely forgotten about. Fouché fought on. Mm. Mm. After the war, when the USA occupied Japan, Fouché, or Fouché Ichi Ichikawa, seized the opportunity to effect change. Using wise words and her powers of persuasion, she convinced American General MacArthur to finally give Japanese women the vote. Hmm. Mm. Powerful. 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 Argentina, 1947. Catalyst for change. In the first half of the 20th century, wars had often been the impetus for change, but other kinds of um, upheaval helped women to win the vote by the millennium's end. Charismatic and courageous feminists were often instrumental in sparking these changes, and when new governments came to power or a country was liberated from foreign control, women seized the, women, the moment and the right to vote. Eva Perón, Eva Perón, made a great effort to lift her weary, cancer-ridden body up from the bed. Nothing, not even a fatal illness, could stop her today. The date was November 11, 1951. Four years earlier, Eva had achieved her dream of winning Argentinian women the right to go to the polls. This would be her first and last chance to join them in casting her vote. Many Argentinian suffragists before Eva had fought long and hard for the vote, setting up mock elections and collection petitions, but Eva made it happen even made it happen. She had fought for this vote as she had for everything else in her life, working her way up from humble beginnings to become an actress and then helping her husband, Juan Perón, to become the president of Argentina. Mm -mm -mm. She worked nonstop, organizing meetings and speaking passionately on the radio to win support for Juan and for women's right to vote. It says Eva also won fairer wages and working conditions for women and equal rights in marriage. Mm -hmm. Her struggles to help ordinary working people who called her Evita, 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 won her affection and crowds of supporters greeted her everywhere she went. There's a song or a play don't cry for me, Argentina. Evita. I'm just saying. Made me think of it. She won their affection and crowds of supporters greeted her everywhere she went. What joy she felt when Juan became president in 1946 and soon after in 1947 when thousands of women poured onto the streets of Argentina to celebrate gaining the vote. After making her ballot paper, Evita lay back on what was soon to be her deathbed. She drew her last breath in 1952, aged just 33, and more than three million Argentinians came to pay their respect at her funeral. Wow. 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 Just wow. India, 1949. India. You see, we're talking about all these different uh, women, but different countries. Hence, multicultural, right? Lifting their colorful sari hems from the dusty streets, Princess Sophia Dulip Singh and the other Indian feminists sidestepped potholes as they joined British suffragists in a crowded march through London, UK in 1911. When she was a child, Sophia had watched leopards and cheetahs pacing in cages in her garden. Now it was her mission to free women from the confines that held them back and limited their lives. India at this time was under British rule and just as Argentinian women only won the vote after change of government, Indian women had to wait for a political sea change to be empowered too. 
Back in India, Sophia's infectious enthusiasm inspired Harabi Harabai, and Mithin Tata to join the struggle. Mother and daughter worked tirelessly to persuade UK leaders to give Indian women the vote and to win support from their British suffragist sisters. From a young age, Mithan had devoured books by English feminist Annie Besant. So she bristled with pride when she stood to address MPs in London alongside, alongside Besant and Indian feminist Sarojini Naidu. And so go ahead, pause, and read the rest from here down. Because there's some important information right there. China, 1949. China. Hmm. The women of India used speeches and demonstrations to win the vote. But some feminists in China drew inspiration from rebel British suffragists or suffragettes and militant heroines of their own, like the legendary sword-wielding Mulan, Mulan, who disguised herself as a male warrior to win glory on the battlefield. When she was young, Tang uh, Kunying had adored stories of Mulan and like her daredevil idol, she was, she too was a firefighter. She too was a fighter. An expert swordswoman, Tang led female soldiers into battle during a violent revolution to bring down a cruel emperor in 1911. Now she led female comrades in their struggle for women's rights. Tang set up the first women's suffrage group and campaign for girls to get an education. She also helped to win the crusade to ban foot binding. I remember um, reading and seeing videos on how women in China had to bind up their foot to keep their foot small. It was it was a thing to, because they, they wanted them to have small feet so they would bound them up so that they wouldn't grow. It was, yeah, it was kind of different. So it says, and she was an expert swordsman. Tang led female soldiers into battle during a violent revolution to bring down a cruel emperor in 1911. Now she led female comrades in their struggle for women's rights. Right. She set it up. Um, women's suffrage groups and campaign for girls to get an education. She also helped to win the crusade to ban foot binding, a cruel ancient practice in which girls' feet were tightly wrapped to bend and break them so they could be squashed into tiny, dainty shoes. Broke them to be squashed into tiny, dainty shoes. Tang glanced down at her own small feet. They might be painfully bound, but they could still run and kick. They would not slow her down today. Raising a pistol in her hand and uttering a battle cry to rally the fearless women beside her, Tang and her comrades stormed into Parliament to, man to, to demand to speak about women's suffrage in 1912. When they were refused, the rebel women were furious. They hurled a torrent of abuse smashed windows and kicked a guard to the ground. Troops were called in to force the women to retreat. Tang's militant tactics failed, but they inspired Chinese suffragists to ramp up their peaceful protests. Wars within their country and the Second World War delayed their progress. Their progress, progress. But in 1949, when a new government declared China a people's republic, women won the vote. Such was Tang's commitment to education. She also founded two girls' schools in Shanghai. Beautiful story. Beautiful. Egypt. We have Egypt, Switzerland, Nigeria, Qatar, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, left to read. So let's do this. Egypt in 1956. If China's warrior women were the natural heirs, heirs 
to Mulan, Egypt's suffragists surely inherited strength from their powerful past too. In ancient Egypt, a woman could only become pharaoh or ruler in special circumstances, but otherwise women were equal to men. The warrior goddess of healing, uh, Sakmet, was even depicted as a lioness, the fiercest hunter. But by the 20th century, Egypt's lioness no longer had equal status to men. By 1951, fearless feminist Doria uh, Shafik, leader of the Egyptian Feminist Union, had had enough. She and 1,500 other courageous women marched on the Egyptian parliament and her roar of defiance echoed around the world. The attack failed, but Doria did not give up. And in 1954, she took action again. Doria and a small group of her supporters took over the offices of the Egyptian press and began a hunger strike, refusing all food. After eight days, Doria was weary. Her stomach rumbled and the face that greeted her in the mirror was thin and gaunt. But she drew strength from the fact that photos of the groups of the group starving but determined in hair rollers and dressing gowns had captured the world's attention. When officials arrived to try to persuade the women to end their protests, Doria turned them away, sensing that victory was near. She was right with the eyes of the world upon it and pressure mounting, the newly elected government finally gave in. Ministers set out a new constitution in 1956, including women's right to vote. Wow, women voting. Why was that so hard for men? I don't understand. I don't know why that was so hard for men to allow women to vote. Okay. Mm. Switzerland, 1971. The radical actions of feminists in some other countries made many people in conservative Switzerland think female suffrage was a dangerous threat to the traditional roles of women and men. Realizing aggressive tactics could backfire and lose them support, Swiss suffragists in the 1960s focused on using a considerable powers of persuasion to win the vote. It was hard for suffragists to swallow their ex exasperations when they remembered how long they had been struggling for equal rights. As far back as 1928, their feminist forebears had paraded a model of a giant snail through the capital city's, capital city's crowded streets as a symbol of their impatience with Switzerland's slow rate of change. But there was nothing for it. Every major change in a Swiss law required a referendum. So the only way to win the vote was to win the support of the men who voted. The women talked to as many people as they could, even traveling to lonely mountain villages where they gently but forcefully persuaded their listeners that it was time to give the women the equality they deserved. In 1971, these same women waited tensely outside polling stations across the country while their male friends, partners, and neighbors went to cast their votes on a new suffrage law. The majority voted in their favor and the wait was over at last. The power of per persuasion had prevailed. Switzerland, 1971. Nigeria, 1976. Shout out to my sister. Yeah, that was the year she was born. I'm just saying. Through her round rimmed glasses, Fun Mila, Mil, Milayo Ransom, Kuti's piercing eyes, glared furiously at the guarding at the guard brandishing the auto stick and roaring threats. It was 1944 and Fun, Mila, Fun Milayo had rallied female market traders in England to protest about the unfair taxes the town's ruler the Alake imposed on them. Now her followers faltered in fear. The auto stick was a mighty symbol of male power, male power, and defying the guards could bring bullying 
beatings and arrests, raising herself up to her full height. Fun Milayo rushed forward and ripped the stick from the guard's grasp. Waving it defiantly in the air, she shouted that women now held the power in their hands. Emboldened, her followers swarmed forward and the humiliated guards ran for cover. So Fumili Fun Milayo was also the first Nigerian woman to drive a car and ride a motorbike. Wow. Well, you can read the rest here because it's very, very interesting um, and informative information. Yes. Qatar, 2003. Kuwait, 2005. Saudi Arabia, 2015. Go ahead and read. Pause and read. Pause and read. Look at that. Pause and read. Amazing stories. Changing the world. Like a row of dominoes falling through history, barriers to equality toppled as one country after another granted women's suffrages. And I will let you read at pause and read this also because this is really interesting. I think I'm going to read this one. Winning the right to vote gave women a voice and a choice and a chance to change their lives. The last 100 years have seen a huge improvement in equal opportunities around the world. But not all the battles are won. Women still have less power, fewer rights and opportunities, lower pay, more limited access to education, and are often treated as less capable than men. Women's suffrage is a brilliant example of what can be achieved when people pull together. Just as suffragists around the world supported each other, today women share advice and ideas via the internet and social media. The fantastic feminists who fought for the vote inspired each other across borders and boundaries, and feminists today continue to inspire girls and women everywhere as they work to create a fairer, more equal world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. It says, this timeline shows the dates when countries of the world granted women the vote. It also shows how suffrage often came in waves, sometimes at times of crisis and change. Many countries gave women the vote after a war, a revolution, or when they become, became independent of foreign rule and wanted to forge a new identity. So here is the timeline. I will be going up slowly. And you can pause and read. Pause and read. Pause and read. Wow. Pause and read. Wow. Amazing list. Amazing list. And that, my dears, my dearies, is the end of this book. The end, the end, the end. Oh, yeah. The end. Thank you for being here, you guys. Thanks for listening to me read. I know it was a long book, but these were some important, some important, important information that I just read to you. The global right, the global, well, rebel voices, the global fight for women's equality and the right to vote. Important information in this book right here. So please listen, listen again and listen again. Share my videos, yes. Share my videos, like my videos, yes. Go to YouTube and subscribe to my YouTube channel, Audrey's Reading Area. Shout out to all of you that are here right now listening to me, including my mom. Thank you, thank you. And those who share my videos, including my girl, Victoria. Thank you all so much. And I'll see you again tomorrow live, L-I-V-E. Live at five tomorrow here at Audrey's Reading Area.
All right, all right, all right. You know I had to say that, right?